Our first speaker in this session is Dr. Mary Beth Ingham. Sister Mary Beth was formerly professor of philosophical theology at the Franciscan School of Theology, and she currently serves as congregational leader for the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange. Sister Mary Beth holds a doctorate in medieval philosophy from the University of Freiburg in Switzerland and has published and lectured widely on the thought of Franciscan master, Blessed John, John Don Scotus. In several publications, she argues that the pathway of beauty, the via pulchritudinis, is at the foundation of Franciscan life and thought. She currently serves as a regent for the Franciscan school. Her respondent will be Dr. Maureen Day, Associate Professor of Religion and Society at the Franciscan School. And so we welcome Sister Mary Beth for her talk, The Harmony of Goodness. Thank you very much. And I too thank you for returning. I want to express my gratitude to the organizers of this conference, especially Father Garrett, Sister Juliet, and the wonderful, wonderful staff who's welcoming us and making this such a, such a beautiful experience. Thank you. So I'm doing my own tech here, so we'll see how that works out. In Eating Beauty, the Eucharist and the Spiritual Arts of the Middle Ages, Anne Astle explores the Franciscan attention to beauty through Bonaventure's writings. She identifies his Legenda Maior, or major legend, as an icon, consciously crafted as a work of beauty in honor of the saint whom Bonaventure regarded as God's artistic masterpiece. Astel parallels the major legend with the itinerarium to show how, for Bonaventure, the form of a work mirrored its image and message. A teaching on the transformation of Francis must itself be beautiful. Its form reflects that of the transformative human journey into understanding and loving union with beauty itself. To understand Astell's point, we must reimagine how central beauty was for ancient and medieval thinkers. Beauty was not simply understood as the object of human desire, contemplation, and love. Beauty framed a spiritual journey of transformation a veritable via pulchritudinis. We become what we love. We certainly see this in Augustine's writings as well as Bonaventure's. For just as the world around us gives brilliant testimony to order, measure, and proportion, the three properties of the beautiful, so the inner world of spiritual and moral transformation witnesses to the dynamic power of beauty as cause and principle for all that is. As we gather to reimagine the world in a Franciscan moral key, let us begin with a reflective exercise. Imagine for a moment that there is in nature a being which exceeds all others in beauty. This being is the highest possible, most perfect, and most beautiful. Now suppose as well that this most beautiful being were also the source of the eye's ability to see it. And in addition, suppose that the activity of vision itself delighted in this sight. And so in seeing this object, the eye's love of seeing would be satisfied to the full. Object, ability, experience. 
all are caught up in beauty. How might such an experience transform us, the way we see ourselves and the way we see the world? For Franciscans, the experience of beauty is first and foremost a spiritual experience that informs and transforms moral living. Beauty, living beauty, invites us to enter into the dynamic of divine love as foundation for moral life. In that dynamic, we participate in the beauty of the world, the beauty of rational love and the beauty of God. When we're authentically involved in the experience of created, natural, and rational beauty, we can become artists, co-creators of beauty in the created order. And this is the key to the ethical vision inspired by, by St. Francis. So as we reimagine the world today through a Franciscan lens, it's appropriate that I'm getting some musical background <laughs> to this. It's a harp which I think is really a, a beautiful image. Yeah. Oh, keep it up. As we reimagine the world today through this Franciscan lens, we cannot ignore the challenges to this vision, especially as it relates to moral living. So in my presentation today, I want to explore two areas within the Franciscan moral approach based on the lens of beauty. First, a theoretical challenge, and second, a practical opportunity. And then, of course, in order to complete this presentation a la St. Bonaventure, I will conclude with a threefold reflection on implications. So, first, the theoretical challenge. Any moral theory based on beauty must face the charge today that it's overly subjective. Someone might retort to us, to the Franciscans, you espouse a moral theory that depends on differences in taste. What I find beautiful, someone else may not. How can this be a moral theory worthy of the name? And here we see an important criticism that we must take seriously, especially in our world today. So in order to respond appropriately to this fundamental challenge, we must first enter completely into the dynamic of love and beauty and experience that lies at the heart of Franciscan thought. And so let us recall some key Franciscan commitments, especially such as we find in Bonaventure's itinerarium. First, all that exists possesses an inner goodness as a gift from God. Creation itself gives witness to beauty bearing the imprint of the creator. And as Bonaventure says, if you cannot recognize this, you're a fool. Second, we humans are spiritual homing pigeons, rationally drawn to God. Our hearts may be restless, yet as rational beings, we're endowed with two metaphysical affections, and these are foundational dynamic energies or dispositions rather than emotional felt affections. And these energies or dispositions are directed toward the good. Each one, each moral disposition tends toward the good as an object yet understood in a particular way. The affection for justice, which is the higher and free affection, tends toward goods of intrinsic value, such as truth or honor. This affection has an unselfish quality about it. It is not self-interested. It is disinterested. It's directed toward a good other than myself, a good that has value in and of itself that I recognize. But this is not our only energy. For we also possess a native and natural love for our own good. 
This is called the affection for happiness or possession, and it tends toward those goods that serve my own well-being. This dynamic energy draws me to love in a self-interested manner, especially when it is unchecked by the affection for justice. So they both are in us naturally, and they both work together. And together, they're meant to work in harmony. Together, they constitute free choice. So moral living, according to this vision, is really based upon balancing my innate and good desire for my own well-being with my deep desire for moral integrity and love for others, my good and the common good. In their interaction, we recognize how the love of friendship itself, both other-centered and personally rewarding, fulfills both of our deepest desires. The love proper to friendship is the highest moral act because it integrates both of these natural energies and affections. So character formation in this vision and moral development require self-possession, self-restraint, and ultimately self-gift. Such a lifelong progress in moral growth is possible when the affection for justice and the affection for happiness are actively engaged with one another in a creative tension. So it's not one or the other, it's both together. This intricate moment of balance between the two affections gives birth to enlightened self-transcendence, a spiritual experience. Like the dancer, the moral agent possesses an inner poise and balance waiting for the spirit's inspiration. This is the moment immediately prior to action, a moment of fullness for the person ready to engage in generous action. And this moment involves a spiritual waiting and watching for the right moment. Known immediately to anyone who has experienced it, this internal spiritual balance of these two moral energies requires years of training and years of self-discipline, as we know. Not only do we imagine the world as a beautiful gift and ourselves as potential artists, but moral actions themselves possess a rich beauty. So how might we reimagine these through a Franciscan lens? Fortunately, blessed John Don Scotus takes up this question directly when he analyzes the objectivity of love as foundation for moral living. In a deepening threefold reflection on the act of love, and especially love for God, Dun Scotus peels back the threefold dimensions to the term objectivity in any moral act. And thanks to this analysis, we can understand the reason why, for Franciscans, Rigorous, rational love is not simply the heart of moral living. It's the central and objective ground for everything we do. In the Ordinatio, John Don Scotus explains the objective quality of love according to three different meanings. First, the term objective refers to the object, the object which is suited by nature in itself to satisfy the desire I express in the act of love. This object is the true end or goal of the activity of loving. In a general way, this term certainly applies to the good, which is the object of all desire. But the term objective applies to God in the fullest sense Scotus argues, 
since God alone is infinite goodness. For God is suited by nature to satisfy the longings of the human heart. God is the object of human love in this first fullest sense. Indeed, as the highest and most perfect good, God is the only necessary object of love. This makes the command to love God above all things, the first commandment, the only necessary command of the moral law. Within the human heart, this is natural law, the most perfect human act of which we are capable. And Scotus affirms, to love God above all is an act conformed to natural right reason, which dictates that what is best must be loved most. And hence, such an act is right of itself. Indeed, as a first practical principle, this is something known per se. And hence, its rectitude is self-evident. For something must be loved most of all, and it's none other than the highest good, even as this good is recognized by our intellect as that to which we must adhere most. Just in case you ever want to say at a cocktail party that you can <laughs> drop a quote. In this first and foundational sense of objective, highest good can be identified as the most appropriate moral object, so it's the first commandment. And yet, this term has no personal qualities yet, nor is it necessary that the highest good love me in return. So this first approach to objectivity, while proper, is still incomplete, and it opens to a second. The second meaning of the term objective refers to the how of loving. It's the aspect of justice according to which someone loves God. For believers, God is loved most rightly when loved as one who is present, self-revealing, and faithful. So now we enter the dimension of moral living that goes beyond an impersonal set of categories or abstract ideals to the personal and relational dimension that Father Dan mentioned earlier this morning. This second dimension implies what is really most central to the Judeo-Christian understanding of God, that is, the act of divine self-revelation and intimate protective presence, both in the theophany to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3.15, where God pronounces the divine name, I am, and we know from Hebrew that the real meaning of that is, I am here to save. And in this act of self-revelation, God establishes the possibility of a loving friendship central to the covenant, which will be fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ in the incarnation. Such a divine free desire to establish this relationship of covenant offers an additional objective basis to the moral law. For now, it's the expression of how God desires that we treat one another. There are, in fact, two great commandments, to love God and to love the neighbor. We're called to love our neighbor as ourselves. And justice here means right relationships, both toward God and toward others. We love one another because God has first loved us. And again, Scotus affirms, not only does God Am I on the red slide? Yes. Not only does God's infinite goodness, so that's the first meaning, not only does God's infinite goodness or nature as this unique nature in its uniqueness draw us to love such, 
but because this goodness loves me, sharing itself with me, therefore I elicit an act of love towards it. And under this second aspect of amiability, one can include everything about God that proves God's love for us, whether it's creation or redemption or preparing us for beatitude in heaven. Hence, he deserves to be loved in return. According to that text from John, let us love God because he has first loved us. So moral living now deepens, according to Scotus' reflection, as we discover relationship as the key to human fulfillment. I begin to love God because I recognize that God is infinite goodness and infinite beauty. God is therefore the most appropriate object of my love. My initial love for God is enhanced and intensified through the experience of the divine loving presence within and around me. And this experience of communion grows, not as a direct result of my loving God, but of God's loving presence to me. So God loves in and through me. I'm not alone in my moral living. The relationship of friendship now continues to increase in its dynamism and intensifies my own acts of love. This loving dynamic does not stop there. For there, here there is no me and Jesus moral vision. Rather, it extends outward to others. For God is not my good or my personal possession, but everyone's good, a common good. At this point, the personal spiritual relationship of love at the heart of moral living begins to inform all of my actions and all of my moral choices. Moral living is motivated by a rigorous love for God and others. And each moral action is seen as one part of a greater whole, an expanding moral community, a lifetime based upon loving as God loves. So now we begin to reimagine with the Franciscans a moral community of co-lovers, always extending to the furthest margins. And here, quote, uh, Scotus says again, now it could be that someone is considered dear because of a private love where the lover wants no co-lovers, as is exemplified in the case of jealous men having an excessive love of their wives. Take note. <laughs> but this sort of habit of love would not be orderly or perfect. Not orderly, I say, because God, the good of all, does not want to be the private or proper good of any person exclusively. Nor would right reason have someone appropriate this common good to themselves. And in so loving, I love both myself and my neighbor out of charity. That is, by willing that both of us love God. And this is something that is simply good and an act of justice. So justice we're seeing in the context of the Franciscan vision is the biblical understanding of justice that's right relationships um, with all. Continued reflection on this second perspective on objectivity of love points to the reciprocal relationship common to friendship. Such a personal relationship is objective in the sense that it transcends the subject or points toward what is often spoken about today as intersubjectivity. While the first meaning of objective made sense according to natural reasoning, this second is only possible when we recognize and experience God as a trinity of persons continuing to take initiative in human history, continuing presence. Such a God remains faithful despite our infidelity. 
And so here again, the focus shifts more profoundly from my love for God to God's love for me, and in fact, to God's love for everyone and every living being, even the rocks. The third and final perspective on the objectivity of love, SCOTUS identifies this concomitant experience of loving, which is delight or joy. The delight or joy which accompanies the activity of loving God. Now, SCOTUS admits that this is not, properly speaking, a formally objective reason, since it's the consequence of the act of loving God. Nevertheless, he says, inasmuch as this joy always accompanies the act of love, it serves as an additional object for me to love. For why would I want to deny myself such exquisite delight? And here, in this final moment, I love the act of loving itself. So here is the reimagined moral foundation, completely cast against the backdrop of love for divine beauty, ever ancient and ever new. Moral living admits of a threefold objectivity. As object, God is the highest good. As manner, the purest love is friendship, not possession. And as result, the sign of love is joy and delight. Now, if you recall the reflective exercise I invited you to consider at the outset of this talk, you can see the power of this transformative paradigm for moral living. For it's framed in love and beauty, filled with love and beauty, creative of love and beauty. For in fact, the reflective exercise at the outset of this talk was how Scotus concluded his threefold meditation on the objectivity of love. Such a reflection on a concrete experience of beauty, which I've chosen to replicate here as a sunset, which because Scotus's text reminded me of the passage from Augustine's Confessions, where he and his mother Monica experienced the beautiful sunset at Ostia, their vision of divine beauty and divine goodness. This reflection on a concrete experience of beauty moves from the initial experience to deeper and deeper appreciations of how beauty and joy belong to the heart of all that exists. Here is indeed a renewed moral paradigm for this new millennium. The experience of beauty, founded on the good, reveals that love grounds all reality. And love sustains the journey taken by the human heart. But it's an expanding and inclusive love. For the via pulchritudinis is also a via amoris, a pathway of love. The primary reason for charity and the purest motivation of our love for God is found in the divine nature itself, a trinity of persons in loving relationship as source and inspiration. Our moral living is a response to God's love for the world and for us. And here, charity and justice meet. And so now let's move to the second portion, which is a practical opportunity. The Franciscan moral vision is one of rigorous loving. It is neither legalism nor simply doing what a person feels like at any given moment. This vision challenges every moral action to measure up, not against personal preference or moral autonomy, but against divine action and divine generous love. It calls us to strengthen solidarity with one another especially those in most need. And this requires concrete actions in real circumstances, where there may not be much raw material for beauty. Even in these dire moments, we are called to love as God loves, to be filled with the compassion of Jesus. Here is love 
beyond subjective taste. And this love transforms us. So what practical opportunities can we consider as we deepen our reflection on this Franciscan way of moral living? Two examples come readily to mind, and like Father Dan, I did not consult with Brother Bill before I gave my talk. So clearly the Holy Spirit is moving us all in the same direction. Two examples come readily to mind, both presented to us by Pope Francis. In Laudato Si, Francis invites us to expand our moral horizon by framing moral responsibility toward the entire created world in terms of divine, generous love. We are to live in this world as those who have received a gift of beauty from the Creator. Our response, our moral response, is one of gratitude, rigorous love, and care for our common home. This prompts a dramatic shift in considering what matters, a shift from the individual to the common good. We often think of our situation on lifeboat Earth as one where our care for the Earth is really an indirect way of caring for ourselves. And of course, we know there is an impact on us and on future generations, for there is no planet B. Nevertheless, the Franciscan moral vision provides us with a higher moral motivation for our environmental compassion over and above personal self-interest. Indeed, against the background of love that I've traced out, even if the planet were not in such danger, this Franciscan vision would call us to act generously, to live simply, and to share what we have so that others might simply live. The riches of this world are a gift to be shared with all. Generosity and compassion are the virtues needed today. Grounded in love for others, our natural desire for goodness takes us beyond ourselves. For in being human, we are more than human. Here is where the theological virtue of charity, my love for God, transforms us into loving with God as God loves. And in Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis explores the moral journey as one of solidarity, of relationship through the parable of the Good Samaritan. While the scribe and the priest might have had good reasons, legal and moral, to pass by and not notice and help the wounded man, the Samaritan went beyond simply giving the help that was needed at that moment. He ensured the survival and the health of the man by paying for care, he, by paying for the care the innkeeper would give. And as a Samaritan, he put his own life at risk. This type of relational solidarity can be replicated by each one of us every day. It involves a transformation of attitude, a seeing more in a situation than what lies on the surface, more than what the law requires, more than what custom requires. For what made him stop? What did he see? Whom did he see in that moment that the priest and the scribe did not? The Samaritan saw more than the wounded man and more in the wounded man than the others did. He did not see a threat. He saw an opportunity to respond to the ugliness of human suffering and in responding, transform that moment into one of beauty. The goal of moral living is such an act of selfless loving, totally determined by the value of another. Here is the perfection of the human affection for justice I mentioned earlier, which is our highest and most free moral tendency. 
It is in our affection for justice as right loving that we're able to love another in a generous manner. It is by this affection, this energy, that we're able to love someone else for themselves alone and not merely because of what that person brings to us. Our transformation into love moves us beyond ourselves and any one particular individual. In our loving, thanks to beauty, we now move outward toward greater and greater inclusivity toward the entire created world. Moral living is no longer a question of legalism. It's about keeping the relational bonds with all of life. The dynamic activity of charity expands to create a community of all persons, all beings, as co-lovers with God. It is in this way that rigorous love completes and perfects the human journey. Charity is the divine gift of love that constitutes and sustains the relationship of friendship with God that transforms us bringing us from our own individual cares to a, to a participation in divine communion and divine outreach. We enter the life of the Trinity, a life of love, a life of beauty, and joy-filled generosity. For all is gift. We have only to respond generously. So finally, how might we conclude this reflection on the Franciscan reimagining of moral living framed entirely by goodness, love, and beauty? I suggest that there may be three areas we can identify as implications of this vision of beauty and its role in moral living. All three challenge us to continue to reflect upon the riches inherent in this important spiritual tradition. First, this Franciscan moral vision recalls an ancient and more spiritually informed vision of beauty as, and its relationship, its inherent relationship to moral living. It opens the way to consider recognition and judgment of the good with the experience of beauty and harmony. We also discover in this integrated vision of the human person an artist, an artist of living. Like the trained artist, the morally mature person has an eye for the good, has an ear to hear the promptings of the divine whisper in every moral moment, for we are not alone. This person knows, for example, what to look for, in any situation, how to broaden the moral context under consideration to see beyond a narrow frame. This expands moral living beyond the narrow set of crises decisions we too often identify with ethical reasoning and moral action. For just as beauty surrounds us, so too our entire lives offer an expanded context for moral living. Consequently, autonomy, so often prized as the summit of moral development, fails. For it's not autonomy that is the moral goal, but it's moral relationship, moral commitment, and moral self-gift that constitute the pinnacle of human growth, human development, and ultimately, human happiness. Like the trained musician, the morally mature person has achieved a perfection of judgment and performance thanks to years of training and experience. Moral acuity possesses the characteristics of perfect pitch. Aspects are compared to a foundational tone, we might say moral truth, the first great commandment. Harmony is recognized in that relationship of all elements in a particular context and possesses a moral objectivity 
based upon the nature of moral objects and moral truths. For the first practical principle, Deus delegendus est, God is to be loved, stands as an analytic principle. Scotus states, if God exists, then God is to be loved as the highest good and in the highest manner. This principle, I believe, serves as the moral tuning fork for us, for science, for moral law. It's the basis upon which we make our moral judgments. To consider love for God as foundation for moral living is to understand God as bonum honestum, intelligible beauty for Alexander of Hales, the object of the affection for justice. And so morally, decisions and actions in the concrete are called to share in the beauty of the created order, where timing, placement, manner, intention, and object are all meant to be attuned to the highest moral principle. This is not easy. Such a Franciscan model for moral discernment sees the human person as a moral performing artist. Here is someone who's able to assess the moral situation from the perspective of its potential for rational beauty, seeing what's not there and bringing it into being. And to regard moral training as an apprenticeship in beauty with rehearsal and practice as part of the development of character. Indeed, according to this Franciscan frame, mistakes and errors are part of the life of ongoing learning, conversion, and moral development, not to be avoided. Second, the Franciscan moral vision is personalized. It's a much more personalized moral vision from identifying the objectivity of beauty as a characteristic of this created order to recognizing how God can be understood and loved as beauty beyond compare, John Don Scotus mines the concrete human experience of beauty to unpack the spiritual intuitions behind his moral arguments. Again and again, he recurs to the experience of harmonic tones to illustrate the distinct levels of moral reasoning from the highest and most intimate acts of understanding to the identification of moral action with performance and ultimately to the joy and delight experienced by the divine ear in hearing the music of the human heart. This shift toward beauty suggests a following question. Might this Franciscan approach actually give moral judgments greater certainty based on the certainty of an immediate experience of moral beauty? If so, then moral reasoning itself can be reimagined as a type of moral insight similar to spiritual discernment. This points to a penetrating awareness of all that is present and most relevant in a context of moral import, along with the immediate recognition of what to do. The mature moral person acts immediately, like Francis giving his cloak to the noble knight. And again, the Good Samaritan serves as an example for his ability to act quickly and generously shows him to be morally wise, a person of reflective awareness and life experience. Such an identification of moral insight with immediate generous action personalizes the Franciscan vision as a way of life and not just a way of making decisions. This approach is personalized in a way that contrasts with Aristotle's syllogistic moral deduction as well as a utilitarian calculus, which offer a depersonalized and more abstract moral goal. 
Such a moral reimagining holds the seeds for a program of moral education and training that identifies goodness with beauty. Moral education would center on the development of a taste for the beautiful, not a mere attraction to the superficially agreeable, but rather a deep appreciation of beauty in the totality of all aspects of life. This integrates the highest awareness of fundamental moral principle of generous love, the alignment of moral motivations and actions, the balance and harmony of acting in such a way that all elements of an action are taken into account, time, place, and manner. The complete fulfillment of moral living would not merely involve taking the law or principle into account, nor would it rely upon an Aristotelian model of sequential deliberation of means in light of an end. Rather, it's most fully captured in the immediate recognition of the good in particular concrete moments as a developed moral insight. Such an act of recognition requires a mature and well-formed moral creativity, similar to that of the Samaritan, who brought forth and enhanced the beauty of a con in a concrete moral setting. Finally, I suggest that we have some good grounds for holding that for the Franciscan moral perspective, beauty replaces virtue as central to the discussion of the sorts of things that we might include with character. Justice, an important Aristotelian virtue, is identifying as beautifying the soul by Alexander of Hales, by Bonaventure, and by Duns Scotus. What's more, charity, the highest theological virtue, perfects the affection for justice and enhances the will's rational freedom. The presence of charity in the soul, states Scotus, renders it beautiful and delightful to God. So this may mean where Aristotelians speak and Thomists speak of virtue, Franciscans speak of beauty. The Franciscan lens of beauty takes us far beyond moral fundamentalism moral legalism, and invites us to enter an expanded moral realm and consider the creativity of moral response. Moral living now opens to transcendence and to an ever-expanding circle of relationship, friendship, and love. As Richard Cross has suggested in a recent article, John Dunn Scotus's analysis and framing of moral goodness in beauty allows us to reimagine the human condition. Not an arena for sin, failure, punishment, or mistakes to be avoided. Not an arena for divine justice, but rather as a context within which beauty is revealed, even in, and perhaps especially in, situations of human impairment. For just as in heaven, we find an expanded spiritual context where a given physical impairment, such as the loss of a limb or human paralysis, will no longer cause suffering because it's no longer needed, so too on earth, the moral response to cases of diminishment, exclusion, injury, and physical impairment may lie in the generous expansion of welcome, outreach, and inclusion. When we, like the Good Samaritan, live in such a broadened and generous moral universe with potential for beauty and relationship at every turn, then we too can help to give birth to a, nude, a renewed Franciscan vision in our world today. Thank you.
Thank you, Mary Beth, for that thoughtful analysis. You've given us much to consider as to how we might more intentionally incorporate beauty into our moral lives. What you propose is a very compelling vision that is so much needed in our world right now. And while there are many individual pieces I could lift up to respond to, I am choosing a thread woven throughout. The Good Samaritan. And for those of you who do not know, I am a sociologist, so please be prepared for a response rooted in that, in that discipline with some considerations of what Mary Beth offered us in light of daily living. Looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan, there are so many perspectives we can take here. We can focus on the symbolism throughout the story, the role of the innkeeper, the priest and the Levite, the victim, Jesus' conversation with the expert on the law that bookend the telling of this parable. Any of these perspectives promise amazing sources of wisdom. Mary Beth's lecture turns our attention to the Samaritan and the very ugly reality he stumbled upon, an ugly reality he rendered beautiful through his compassion. And now for my sociological edition. What sort of factors lead us to respond like the Samaritan? And what factors lead us to respond more like the priest and the Levite? In their 1973 study, From Jerusalem to Jericho, social psychologists John Darley and Daniel Batston set out to figure this out. They wanted to test three factors. First, they thought a person's spiritual type the spiritual equivalent of a personality test, could determine this. They reasoned that it could be that some people have a spirituality more like the priest and the Levite, and other spirituality is more like the Samaritan. Using a spirituality inventory, they would categorize their participants into three categories. Some might be religious because of what they gain through religion. Darlene Batson reasoned that that given how critical Jesus was of the religious leaders of his day, this what's in it for me attitude might have been the one of the sins that Jesus was trying to admonish. This, relig this religion as a means to an end is the first of their three spiritual types. The second type is religion simply as an end. That is, religion is, valuable, is a valuable set of beliefs and practices in and of itself. The final spiritual type was religion as quest, which is to say people who seek to discover the meaning in their everyday lives. These second and third types, religion as end and religion as quest, could be what is animating the Samaritan. So this spirituality inventory was given to, uh, was part of the experiment and they gave it to each of the participants. The second factor they wanted to look at is how what one happens to be thinking about at the time of an event, how does that affect their choice? The thinking is that if this priest and Levite were on their way home uh, or on their way to some religious event in Jericho or had just completed some sort of religious rite in Jerusalem, um, they might be reflecting on this. For the priest and the Levite, conventional religious duties might be top of mind. While we know much less about the Samaritan, we can probably guess that his mind was likely occupied with things of a more mundane nature. So to know what participants in Darley and Batson's experiment were thinking, they simply asked them to think of one of two things, and I'll get to this in a bit. The third factor they wanted to look at was busyness. They reasoned that the priest and the Levite were people of social prominence. They perhaps had full schedules with other people of social prominence. In the humorous words of Darley and Batson, quote, one can imagine the priest and the Levite, prominent public figures, hurrying along with their little black books full of meetings and appointments, glancing furtively at their sundials. <laughs> the Samaritan likely had fewer and less socially important people counting on him to be somewhere at a particular time. And so, li and so he lived a life that was rest less riddled with urgency than the priest and the Levite. So these were their three factors, spiritual type, what is top of mind, and degree of hurry. Here's what they did. First, you should know that this experiment was not done with the general public. Everyone involved was in seminary school. <laughs> Why? 
by the throne. <laughs> okay, so helping behavior, we should hope, should come naturally to these seminarians. So in a first session, the experimenters administered a spirituality inventory so that they knew the spirituality type of each seminarian. In the second meeting, the actual experiment took place. Participants arrived individually and were told they were participating in a study of the vocational careers of seminary students, which required them to give a three to five minute talk on the topic. Some were told that their talk would be on the professional skills they were gaining in seminary and how they could, they, and how they could imagine these skills being applied in their post-seminary lives. Others were asked to give a talk on the parable of the Good Samaritan. So to be clear, the Samaritans were either thinking about religious duties and skills, or they were thinking about the Good Samaritan. They would be thinking about what they'd say on their way to the other nearby building where they would ostensibly give the talk upon their arrival. Then they were assigned to a high hurry, intermediate hurry, or low hurry condition. If they were in the high hurry condition, the experimenter looked at his watch and said, oh, you're late. We, they were expecting you a few minutes ago. We'd better get moving. The assistant should be waiting for you, so you'd better hurry. It shouldn't be just a minute. In the intermediate hurry condition, they were told, the assistant is ready for you, so please go right over. And in the low hurry condition, the experimenter said, it'll be a few minutes before they're ready for you, but you might as well head on over. If you have to wait over there, it shouldn't be long. And this is when the critical piece of the experiment happened. On their way from building A to building B, our, figur our figurative Jer Jerusalem to Jericho, they would encounter what we call a confederate, which is a person who is cooperating in the, in the experiment but doesn't obviously appear as part of the team. <laughs> this confederate is an ambiguous victim. He was slumped in a doorway, head down, eyes closed, not moving. And when the subjects went by, he was to cough twice and groan. <laughs> it was not clear whether he needed serious help or simply a few hours to sober up. <laughs> the participants were then rated on a zero to five scale as to how helpful they were. Without going into depth on their rating system, a rating of zero or one means they did not offer any help. A two meant that upon their arrival, they told the aide that there was a man who needed help in the breezeway. Um, a three, four, or five, um, count, uh, and the, the two counted as helping for the experiment's purpose. And then a the rating of three, four, or five meant they directly engaged the confederate in some way. And do you know what they found? Take a second to think about what, you'll, what you think we'll find. Of spirituality type, what's on one's mind, and degree of hurry, which do you think will make a difference and which will not? Okay, it sounds like you're making your guesses. Okay. So spirituality type had no effect on whether a person offered to help the victim. Also, whether, whether they were thinking about tasks related to post-seminary life or the parable of the Good Samaritan also had no effect. In fact, some of the seminarians thinking about this parable literally leapt over the Confederate <laughs> on their way to the building. You can't make this stuff up, right? Um, but where we see the profound differences are in the hurry condition. Of those in the low hurry condition, 63% offered help. We then see a decrease among those in the intermediate hurry category with 45% helping. Then there is a drastic drop in the high hurry condition with only 10% offering any help. When the, de when the debriefing was happening, the seminarians who did not help explained their non-helping in one of two ways. First, some said that while they visibly registered the slump man, they did not, in the moment, see him as someone who needed help. Upon reflection, sure, he needed help, but in that moment, they were so focused on getting to the next building, they did not bother to truly see the man and his situation and their possible role in it. It was like the rush had put moral blinders on them, focusing them only on the task at hand. Darley and Batson argue that as the speed of our lives increases, ethics becomes a luxury. Another reason some non-helpers gave was that even though they personally recognized that the man needed help, they felt they could not help because they had already committed 
to helping the experimenters. In other words, the non-helpers' conflict was not whether to help or whether, not, or whether to not help, but whether to help the man or to help the experimenters. They fail to help the man not out of callousness, but because of genuine conflict. These findings have huge implications for Mary Beth's talk. If the parable of the Good Samaritan be, helps us to begin to think through what a moral life guided through beauty, guided by beauty, might look like, these seminarians remind us that there are situational challenges that can prevent us from seeing the many invitational moments in which grace manifests in our everyday lives. Our lives are busy. I imagine that for many of us, our lives are too busy. What beauty are we closing ourselves off to? I am certainly not saying that we should try trade a, a busyness for sloth. What I am saying is that there are many moral implications to a frenetic schedule. We need to be intentional with our schedules and make sure that we are fully present and open to the ways God might not be, might not be just in our plans, but are also in the distractions of our everyday lives. When we are moving from one important task to the next, we need to be able to see God in the in-between, too. Also, having a more open schedule is one way we help to proclaim our own freedom, allowing us to live more fully human lives. It allows us to pause. It allows us to really see and take inventory of a person or situation. And with Mary Beth's insights in mind, greater freedom gives us the ability to contemplate how we might bring beauty to a situation, to ourselves, and to our world. To end on a Franciscan and biblical note, beauty is the compass that points, that points the way to deep relational mercy for people and places most in need of God's love. Thank you, Mary Beth, for reminding us to go and do likewise. Thank you.